Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 152, Ellie Wiesel's Classroom. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. Our guest today is Ariel Berger. His book, Witness, Lessons from Ellie Wiesel's Classroom, was recently published. Ariel Berger spent five years as Ellie Wiesel's teaching assistant at Boston University, and the book brings us a perspective on Ellie Wiesel that we haven't heard very much about before what he was like as a teacher, and what he was trying to teach the students that he saw as part of his legacy. Ariel Berger has a PhD in Religion and Conflict Transformation from Boston University, where Elie Wiesel was his dissertation advisor. He is also a rabbi, an artist, and a teacher. Earlier in his career, he served for six years as the director of the Commission on Jewish Life and Learning at Boston's Combined Jewish Philanthropies. We're thrilled to learn from Ariel Berger today and through him from Elie Wiesel. And we have a little bit of an addendum to this intro. I hope that this doesn't feel too disjointed, but this is important. It's worth it. Because just a couple days before this episode came out, Ariel Berger won a National Jewish Book Award, a 2018 National Jewish Book Award for the book Witness. So we were already excited to speak with him, but we're especially thrilled to be talking to him so soon after this incredibly exciting honor, and he couldn't be more deserving. So with that, we'll continue with the episode, but keep that in mind. And if you weren't going to purchase the book, well, now you really have to. Ariel Berger, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Can you tell our listeners who don't know so much about Elie Wiesel a little bit about his story, who he was, and why he became such an important figure? Sure. Elie Wiesel is probably best known as the author of Night, his memoir about the Holocaust and his experiences as a young teen in the Holocaust. He was born in 1928 in a town called Siget, which is Hungary or Romania or Transylvania, depending on which year we're talking about, because the borders change so often. And in 1944, the Nazis invaded and his, he and Eli Wiesel and his family, together with the other Jews of Siget, were first uh, placed in a ghetto and then deported to concentration camps. He writes about his experiences at night. And after the war, he studied and developed as a person and a kind of spiritual seeker and, and also as a teacher. And eventually, over time, he figured out that one of the most important lessons of his experiences of the Holocaust was that we have to work to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again to anyone, not just to the Jewish people. And so he became first a journalist um, and then a human rights activist and someone who really traveled around the world bearing witness and calling attention to oppression, atrocities, mass murder, genocide around the world. He traveled to Cambodia and to South America, later to Yugoslavia, he was very involved in calling attention to Rwanda, and he also was instrumental in launching the Save Darfur campaign in the 2000s. And many people don't know that he was a teacher for almost 40 years, and that's really how I knew him. He was a teacher at Boston University uh, and, and elsewhere, but mainly at Boston University for 40 years. He taught humanities, religion, philosophy, literature in a very unique and transformative way. Oh, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986, I forgot to mention. And so your book really does focus on the element of Elie Wiesel as a teacher, which is the element that for those of us who knew his reputation well, knew his work well, many of us still didn't know anything about him as a teacher. I'd love to understand how you came to know him as a teacher and also why you thought it was important to write about him as a teacher. Well, first of all, because as you just said, a lot of people don't know, didn't know that he was a teacher at all. If you asked him who he was and what his life was about, he often spoke about teaching as the center of his activities and the driving force of his activities. And he loved teaching and he loved his students. And I knew him that way. And I, I really felt strongly that 
as I said to him in about 10 years ago, somebody needs to write a book about your classroom. And he said, you need to write a book about my classroom. And that's how this book started. But I met him when I was 15 years old after a lecture in New York. And I remember he held his hand out to me and said his name as if I didn't know who he was. I had never heard of him, even though this was right after a lecture that he had given to, I think, something like a thousand people uh, at the 92nd Street Y in New York. Um, and I was really struck by the, the humility of that and the presence that I felt in him. But I was also very shy and intimidated and it took me a while, it took me several years to decide as part of my general kind of searching that I want to talk to this person more. Later on, I enrolled in his course at Boston University. I decided to go to BU in large part because he taught there. And I enrolled in his class. I said one word the entire semester. And that was only because he called on me. Uh, and I was very shy in class. He called on me and he waited. I had to say what I was thinking. And the one word I said in that whole semester was authenticity, which is apparently some kind of magical <laughs> word because... A few weeks later, he invited me to become his teaching assistant uh, the following year. But I declined because I was on my way to Israel to study in a traditional academy of Jewish studies, a traditional yeshiva. And I didn't really feel like I had that much to give yet. I hadn't gone deeply into any sort of any literature. I'd, I'd studied and read a bunch of things, but I didn't feel ready. And when I told him that, he said, I'll wait. And I thought he was being kind, but he really meant it. And seven years later, after I had studied in Israel for a while and become a rabbi and um, done other things, he, I went to see him to get his advice about what I might do next. I was looking at a couple of different job prospects. And he said, I told you I'd wait. Come now and be my TA. So I did. That's how I got to know him in really in his capacity as a teacher. I was his TA, his teaching assistant from... 2003 to 2008. And I got to see his classroom, which was a very unique and powerful place. And that to me was the, the core and the essence of the question that drove me to d dive into this and write this book, which is how do, does someone create a space for moral transformation through education? How, how exactly does that work? So how does that? So so tell us more about the, you just opened up um, a, a big a big set of questions about master teachers and creating uh, what what does it look like in your book and and how has your thinking been shaped by your experience with with Wiesel? So first, there's a lot of there's a lot of attention to creating a space that's truly and deeply hospitable to difference and to people's personal lived questions. I mean, like the, the quote unquote stupidest question you can imagine, or the most personal revealing comment. This is a space that was really open to all of those things with some ground rules having to do with deep respect and deep listening. And I think a lot of that was drawn from Jewish methods and traditions, particularly the idea of and the practice of chavruta, which is, which is paired study when you engage in studies, a traditional way of studying in Jewish context where you study with a partner and you, you're sitting with a partner with a common purpose. You're seeking the truth. You're trying to understand a text usually, but within that common purpose and that shared commitment and that sense of friendship or at least loyalty to your partner, your study partner, you're bashing each other over the head with, with arguments and counter arguments and it can get very heated. And that's really just sort of the starting point of creating a space. So he did that. He honored his students. He, he had students teach at the beginning of every lecture. And all of that is setting the stage. Then when it comes to the actual learning process, so there's, again, many things to say. But at the, at the heart of it was the connection for Elie Wiesel between learning what he called memory and the idea of being or becoming a witness. And to take your question a little further, how can learning transform people? How can it make moral actors and how can it sensitize people? That question for Elie Wiesel was very keen and acute because for him, the question was not only how do we do that in the abstract, but how come it didn't work in the context of Nazi Germany, for example, where many of the architects of the Holocaust were highly educated people? So it clearly is not enough to have a lot of formal education or the transmission of information or even to have great thinkers like Kant or Goethe 
under discussion at your dinner table. It's got to be more than that. And that was, that was the kind of intensity of the question that I think Eloise L. brought to his role as a teacher. And the answer for him was what he called memory, which really has to do with empathy and imagination and getting yourself as a reader or as a student or helping other students to, as much as possible, with a leap of imagination to inhabit the experience of people who came before us. And so reading great literature or reading first-person accounts of oppression, that really has the potential to change you because now you embody all those stories that you've read and you are less likely to walk by someone who's suffering and look the other way. I mean, one of the questions that kept occurring to me as I was reading the book was, what what kind of a college class is this? You know, meaning that we're not used to hearing about or experiencing college classes in the way that you're describing, you know, and, and I guess I was wondering, you know, what kind of academic was Elie Wiesel? Because, you know, it didn't seem like, because because it seems like the usual college class is that you have somebody who's a scholar in a particular area and who is interested in all kinds of arcana about this or that area and and hopefully has pedagogical skills that can make it all exciting, but generally not focused on how is this going to make you a more moral person, or if they do care about that, they're, they don't admit it because it's not what you're supposed to do in the academy. And I guess I'm wondering, how did how did this happen, first of all? How did Elie Wiesel get himself into this position in the first place? And you know, was he also a scholar in ways that we don't know about, or was, was he somehow, because of who he was as a moral voice, able to be appointed at a university and, and, and teach this way? Elie Wiesel was certainly a countercultural academic. He was not acculturated in the academy. He didn't go through the, the years of study in a university setting that lead to someone coming out focusing on arcana and publishing. Um, it, it's really a different story of someone becoming a master teacher. It happens to be in university. And that story actually begins with Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, who approached Elie Wiesel in the 70s about teaching it. City College of New York. And that's how Elie Wiesel started teaching in a university setting. Um, and I think that's, that's something that really took me by surprise also when I first came to Elie Wiesel's classroom as an undergraduate, was exactly what he said. This is really different than my other courses. Uh, the focus was very much on personal application, on formation, on, uh, on transformation and, and subjectivity that was very welcome. And so that was a completely different culture than any other class. And there's a large conversation that many people have had and that I think still needs to be had about the role of universities and the role of humanities in particular in this country and elsewhere. Um, you know, Jack Miles and others, many others have written about the, the erosion of humanities education. But the idea that we specialize and focus on technical questions um, and arcana alone I think that I think that material and that um, endeavor is really important, and always has been. But if we only do that and we forget some of the big picture questions of application and what does this mean for us as a society, then are we producing people who are able to wrestle with any degree of sophistication and nuance with ethical questions or moral questions? And you know, I, I look around the world, and I think we're we're not we're probably not producing as many of those people as we need to. And part of that might have to do with right. the absence of that kind of conversation in universities. Um, I think, and and so it's it's there's a dotted line in my mind between this conversation and the conversation about the arts and cutting arts funding in schools and things like that. Um, and that's what was one of the things that was so interesting to me about Elie Wiesel's classroom was. He, he wasn't about giving answers or telling students what they should think at all. One of the challenges for him as a teacher was the reverence with which people held him as a Nobel Prize winner, as a moral arbiter, or someone who's seen as a moral arbiter of, of the Western world, someone to whom presidents go to get moral advice, you know, and students were intimidated by that. I, and I know that one of his challenges as a teacher was helping students get past that so that they could really say what they think and figure it out for themselves. And he saw his role as giving them good questions and good tools to, um, to wrestle with questions as they 
move out into the world. And I think in general, he succeeded. I saw that movement often of students sort of passively listening for the answers to students becoming engaged as, um, as questioners. And that to me was one of the most exciting things that can happen in, in any educational setting. I want to dwell a little bit on some of the pieces you brought up about universities or like the university. But I also, I, I want to think critically because we, we haven't said something that I think needs to be said, which is Ellie Wiesel was a teacher. And I'm saying that intentionally because there are lots of professors and lots of people that stand in front of rooms and lecture and instruct or whatever that are not teachers. They may or may not, many of them actually don't think of themselves as teachers. They think of themselves as professors. And and um, and I think that's really crucial to name, especially in our university culture today where um, where universities operate explicitly in many ways as corporations and with this transactional idea that um, I've talked to friends of mine who are, you know, young alums of universities who say to me, if they could have just, you know, gotten a degree and if they could have skipped their classes not done, and gotten the degree, like they would have. And to me, it's just like, I don't know, I don't even know how to how to engage with that. Because like, to me, it's so patently obvious that there is something to be gained from the interaction of student and teacher. And it is obvious to me that a teacher is one who teaches people and a student is a, is somebody who is a student of people. And I feel like those terms have just become like nouns that don't imply relationships. Like a student is a student of someone. A teacher is a teacher of someone. If you're a teacher, but you don't have people you teach, then you're not a teacher. If, like if you're a leader who doesn't have followers, you're not a leader. Like we use that word leader a lot. But so that's Lex's rant. But I'm curious ultimately to hear more about what you said in terms of how Ellie Wiesel in his classroom went about like the teaching and and the relating because so much of this is clearly about your relationship with him and and your own studentness. I mean, like um, I, I think of Jewish models where you know there's this idea of finding for yourself or making for yourself even a teacher, f finding somebody to be your teacher in a sense that's more than just like a utilitarian. They taught me some stuff but like a real relationship, you have that, it seems. So what did it look like for that to happen? And maybe beyond just in the Wiesel circumstance, like what could it look like or should it look like for people to have real relationships of student-ness or teacher-ness with others? This is a place where I think Jewish tradition has something to contribute to the, the general broader conversation because that principle of the relationship between students and teachers is so central. And I think of the teaching from the Talmud that if a teacher is exiled for whatever reason, the student has to go with the teacher and vice versa. If a student is exiled, the teacher has to follow the student into exile. That relationship is so important. And there are many stories of this in our tradition. And it's a question of, of lineage. I think there are two major challenges here and they're related. One is we have learned to uh, be skeptical of teachers and we've seen examples of abuses of power and abuses of charisma, um, whether we're talking about sexual impropriety or power imbalances or other things that make us truly and justifiably skeptical of, of anyone in a position of any sort of power. And the other thing is that in, in our community, in the Jewish community, we lost many of our greatest teachers when they were age six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the Holocaust. So we lost a lot of continuity and a lot of the lineages were broken. I'm not only talking about in the, the deep world of the Hasidic community where lineage is explicitly important, but I mean in general in, in the Jewish world. For me, it was very clear early on that I'm a student down to my bones and I will always be a student. I was looking for teachers and I was looking for wisdom. As you find in many Hasidic stories where the, the student chooses the teacher and often sets up a test for the teacher. In those, in those tales, it's like, if the teacher can read my mind, then I'll know that that's my true teacher. But sometimes it's, let me see how the teacher relates to the poor person in front of me in the line. And if the teacher treats that person with tremendous dignity and respect, 
then I will become that person's student and he will be my teacher. And so that sense of setting up certain tests or having criteria was really important to me also, but I also was really actively looking for teachers. And Elie Wiesel, I think, was looking for students. So there's, you know, the, the process of becoming a student requires a certain letting go of ego, putting down some armor, perhaps, allowing some vulnerability, but also keeping your eyes open and knowing what you're looking for. And the process of being a teacher means I'm interested in relationship and I'm not just interested in being in an ivory tower publishing. And you're absolutely correct that often universities reward the latter and publishing is sort of the currency of the realm and great teaching is usually not. So the next question for me is, where do we find great teaching happening? And assuming we're not challenging the underpinnings of capitalism, which is another conversation that maybe we should have, how do we create a market for, uh, for great teaching and for the kind of transformative teaching that we're talking about that's funded, sustainable, supported over time, where teachers get paid a reasonable salary and are honored for what they do? You know, that, those are large conversations. And I think there's hope for that to happen. I think the urgency of the need is there and pretty clear. I want to dig in a little more to some of these questions of authority and power dynamics you've brought up, because we do talk a lot about reimagining the rabbi role and and evening out some of the power dynamics in Jewish life and some of these threads that are really important to us. But what we haven't said quite as much, or I'll speak for me, what I haven't said quite as much is I actually really, really deeply believe in the power of a little bit of a little bit of hierarchical relationship, a little bit um, of having individual kinds of relationships where one person really is, in a sense, the teacher and the other adopts actively a role of learner. And so I'm thinking in particular of one of the key teachings that brought me into my rabbinic program. I, I am in the Jewish Renewal Movement's rabbinical program. And um the leader of the founder of Jewish Renewal was Reb Zalman Shachter Shalomi. And I was reading one of his books before I entered the program. And there was this little story he told about how he was leading some Shabbat gathering or whatever. I think it was like a tish, sort of like a singing and storytelling situation. And he was at the head of the table and he tells a story or does something. And then he says, okay, everybody get up, move one seat to your left. You're the Rebbe now. And it was so powerful to me rabbiing, teaching, this is something you do. It's not something that you are as an identity. It's something you do and that every one of us can do and should do. And so we can each go around our table and, and give our teaching. But, but when we're doing it, we're the teacher. Um, so there's both, there's both layers there. Like there is some hierarchy there because somebody's at the head of the table. So I guess um, I'd love to hear more like what, what does authority look like in a classroom that is, that is in some senses bucking it by having students teach, et cetera, but also, you know, having the Nobel Prize winner have some airtime. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you evoked Reb Zalman. I, I knew him and actually have smicha from Reb Zalman as do other people from the Bada in Yeshiva where I studied because he came to visit and he taught us, but also because that move from noun to verb, rebbeing as a verb, as you said, is so powerful and so liberating. And I've no, I noticed that with Eli Wiesel, yeah, he's the Nobel Prize winner. So students came into the class wanting to hear from him and students were sometimes annoyed that he wanted to hear from them. And a lot of airtime in the class was taken up by students kind of working out their ideas together and, and in conversation. And as I said, every class began with student presenters. So the first 10 minutes of an hour and a half lecture was students speaking. And he said to his students, I will learn as much from you as you will learn from me. So to me, one of the criteria that I, I looked for in a teacher, more important than anything else, do I have even the shadow of a sense that this teacher is going to try to make me into a specific product line? You know, is there sort of a cookie cutter element here? Or is the teacher really going to affirm the reality of the creation that is this student? That kind of openness and humility in the face of the student is, I think, one of the things that I still feel it's important to look for in a teacher. So I think there's a kind of paradoxical. Selective surrender is, is a phrase I used in, a, in my study of some of the Hasidic 
masters, the sense that I will surrender to someone, but only to someone who affirms my autonomy, paradoxically. And a teacher who affirms my autonomy and the reality of me as an individual, that's someone I can give myself over to because I can trust that they're not going to try to distort me or make me into something that I'm not. And at the same time, a great teacher, I think, is in part great because they have great things to teach. And so I'd love to get into a little bit more about what it was that Elie Wiesel was really trying to teach as as you saw it. I mean, I've I've particularly been thinking a lot lately about the proper response to suffering or to oppression, um, you know, thinking about how the Jewish community in America is sort of facing this in a new way for the first time in a long time, at least as a collective sense, that anti-Semitism is back and that the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh was kind of symbolic of this renewed anti-Semitism in America, or maybe in a certain way, for the first time. And I feel like it's particularly in a case like that, where I want to, where I want to draw back to, you know, what I see as one of the paradigmatic texts and values in Judaism, that you should love the stranger because you are strangers in a strange land, or various uh, versions of that that basically say, yes, you suffered and you're suffering. And of course, part of the response to that should be to try to prevent yourself from suffering again. So sure, you know, be careful. But the main lesson, or at least the critical lesson that, as I read it, Judaism is trying to teach because it's not necessarily the natural response is to make sure that this never happens to anyone again, either by you becoming the oppressor or by you being a bystander. And I guess I see Elie Wiesel and his response to the Holocaust as being profoundly, essentially, that value made flesh. And I think a lot about it when we're, we're at a time like this, and especially when it's so often that people say, oh, you can't compare the Holocaust to anything. Don't talk about the Holocaust. Don't, you know, the only lesson to derive from the Holocaust is that we Jews were oppressed in the most severe possible way. And it's a, it's a uniquely Jewish experience. And if you talk about it in relation to any other suffering, you're somehow diminishing the Holocaust and that that wasn't Elie Wiesel's point of view. So I'd love to understand a little more deeply about how you think Elie Wiesel himself as a student learned that lesson from the Holocaust and from Judaism, and, and then also how he thought that lesson could be taught, because it seems that in many ways, that's the struggle that I think we faced for thousands of years, that you can say it, but it's a little hard to teach it. There are pieces of, of how you framed his approach that require more study, and some pieces that I, I would humbly and respectfully even correct. And then the core of it is so central to his message. So the little big piece I would correct is, he was very much against comparisons to the Holocaust, and he did insist on the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And he was concerned about forgetting the Holocaust, but he, was, he said he was even more concerned with what he called the banalization of the Holocaust, of calling, calling other things a Holocaust. And this came up at the founding of the museum in Washington uh, in conversations with then President Carter and others about whether the museum should commemorate and allow people to interact with the story of all the victims of the Nazis or just focusing primarily on the Jews. And Elie Wiesel insisted that it focus on the Jewish story because as he said, not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. There was something unique about the Jewish story here. And yet, and that phrase, and yet, was Elie Wiesel's favorite phrase. So the, the move, we're talking about pedagogy before, one of the classic Wieselian moves in the classroom that I think is really important for us to consider is, and yet, is how do we hold paradox and the tension between two seemingly opposite ideas so he insisted more than any, anyone else on the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And yet, because of that, that's what drove him. That unique story drove him to work on behalf of genocide prevention around the world. And so I remember a story that someone asked him about whether to go to a protest on behalf of Soviet Jewry or to go to a protest against nuclear weapons. I think, I think those were the two 
um, competing uh, events. And he said, and this is in the 80s, I think, he said, go to the protest on behalf of Soviet Jewry. So that's the first half of the dialectic is we have to be, we're not very good at this. I, I think Jews now and society in general, we're not very good at holding tension between particularism and universalism. We have this kind of disturbing nationalism, which insists on a kind of old, modern or even pre-modern sense of tribalism and comes along with xenophobia and triumphalism and hatred and fear and fear mongering on the one hand. And on the other, we have a sense of globalizing the particularity, washing away, assimilating the particularity of people's stories. And after the shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue, I was noticing that there were a lot of social media posts I saw, not a lot, but there were, there were several from the pretty far right and pretty far left, both that didn't mention the word Jew or Jewish or synagogue in, in tweeting or posting about the shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue. So I was very disturbed by that. It reminded me of the, the Soviet Union refusing to mention Jews at the memorial at Babi Yar, which is a, a place of a terrible massacre during the Holocaust by the Nazis. They died because they were Jews. They had a particular identity that needs to be honored. And I felt the same thing here. Tree of Life was attacked because it was a synagogue. They were murdered because they were Jews. We know that. A week or so later, I was in a conversation with, with some friends who were very involved in the Jewish community, and we were talking about Tree of Life and the aftermath. And something else bothered me, which was that we were talking about this terrible event, and we were drawing conclusions about general patterns of hatred and hate crimes and racism and anti-Semitism, and no one was mentioning, and I hadn't men either mentioned the shooting of two elderly African Americans in Louisville in a grocery store, which took place within a few days of the Tree of Life shooting, not to conflate, to keep these distinct. These are distinct instances with particularities and particular stories. But I felt strongly that we have to make the connection between our own personal experience and the killing of Maurice Stallard and Vicki Lee Jones in a supermarket in, 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 in Louisville, Kentucky. And that if we don't do that, we're failing. But if we skip to that too quickly and we don't inhabit our own story, we're also failing. I love the threads about particularism and universalism you're bringing up. They're so important. And I also just really, that, that and yet phrase is really speaking to me. And, and in the spirit of it, I guess I want to throw in an and yet for this conversation, just because for for many of us, and I, I should name at the beginning of this question, I include myself in the we that I'm using here. Um, for many of us, we are troubled by Elie Wiesel's politics in one particular respect, which is around Israel and Palestine. And and I want to bring that up because, A, I, I really believe in in looking at the whole human being at, at any point, and in, even after they've passed really looking at how somebody was both an incredible leader, and in this case, Elie Wiesel, I want to be clear, I do see as just a huge inspiration to me personally and to the Jewish people collectively on so many fronts. I think there's just so much to learn from uh, in in him as as a person, as a legacy. But I also do want to say that I disagree with how he approached Israel and how he approached really Palestinian rights. And for me, some of the actions he took late in his life clash with so many of the other beautiful actions and stances that he took on other issues in other countries. And it relates to that particularism and universalism question. How do we prioritize the particular, the the story that is our own when it comes up against another people's particularism? And in this case, I would argue that's that's Palestinian particularism. And so I wanted to bring that in and also just really broaden it beyond just Elie Wiesel because it's not just about him. I, I often come up against this when people have recently died. There's this whole question of what do we do with with memory? How do we how do we look back at someone? How, and maybe this connects to broader questions of memory. But like with people, how do we honestly look back at someone when we can have this tendency, especially recently after someone has passed, to only emphasize 
the positive for good reason, because we don't want families to be upset in a time of really important mourning and grief. Um, but how can we go about this? How can we go about looking at the whole story? And maybe for those of us that really do understand the issue of Israel-Palestine drastically differently from how Ali Wazel did, what might you or perhaps you to the extent you can channeling his memory, how might he he look to to interact with us? How could we have a conversation about that and and see where we can move forward despite our different approaches? You know, one of the themes of my book is wrestling with the concept of sainthood, a Jewish version of sainthood, and coming to terms with the fact that a person can be simultaneously human and exalted, that we can have something powerfully beautiful about us and at the same time be flawed human beings and that there's no contradiction between the two. There's an entire teaching of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov about this, which is one of my favorite teachings in his works, where he says that the tzaddik, the righteous person, the holy person is holy, is very different than other people, but also has, as he says, also has a digestive tract meaning also has to go to the bathroom, is also a human being. And those two realities coincide and don't contradict. And that means that there's a bridge between the banal, everyday aspects of our lives and ourselves and our highest aspirations. We don't have to renounce our humanity to be something better. We have to ask questions about our teachers while they're alive and after. Um, when I was writing the book, I, I, I took... A, a good amount of time early on to just try to write down all the things I remembered that were not so flattering about the classroom. And I really tried hard to find whatever I could find because I didn't want to write a work of hagiography. I didn't want to mythologize. And at the same time, we shouldn't be so skeptical that we de deny the possibility of of holiness or righteousness in the world. Because if we do, then what are we living for? What are we living toward? Um, so to your question specifically about Israel and the Palestinian people and, and that whole, um, so again, that whole conversation, you know, I think it's legitimate to disagree with Elie Wiesel's positions about anything. And, and, and some of his friends and colleagues did. Um, I have found that the way people talk about this issue and this question about Elie Wiesel and the Palestinians is often skipping over some important things. Uh, for example, his expression of sympathy for the Palestinians in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1986, which was two years before Yasser Arafat indicated in, in any way that he would accept the presence of Jews in a Jewish state. You know, I think Elie Wiesel was close to prime ministers of Israel and that's where he got a lot of his assessment of the situation. He was very close to Yitzhak Rabin they were very, very close friends. He was close with Paris, Shimon Paris as well. But Robin was like a really close friend. And I think his, I think Elie Wiesel's political assessment of what was happening on the ground was driven, informed in large part by that relationship and his relationship with other prime ministers of Israel. And his assessment, which you can agree or disagree with, was that the major block to peace efforts, Oslo and after, uh, had a lot to do with the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. Everything else followed from that. He expressed a lot of sympathy for the Palestinian people, but not not only because of what they were experiencing in relation to Israel, but because of what they were experiencing in relation to their own government. And based on that, he drew conclusions about all kinds of other things, and and you know his his stance on the Iranian nuclear deal and other things followed not only from his assessment of the situation with Israel and Palestine, but his assessment of Iran and taking seriously the words of, of Ahmadinejad. Elie Wiesel said, we've learned to believe the promises of our enemies. We've learned the hard way. So, you know, I think what I want to say with all of that is that here you have someone who has clearly demonstrated moral commitment, not only in theory or by writing checks or writing op-eds, but by actually physically going to places and putting on the flak jacket and the helmet um, so here's someone with some degree of earned moral authority who has an opinion and an assessment of what's happening in the Middle East. And you're welcome to disagree. But I think it, 
I, I think he deserves more than a dismissal of that part of, of his position or saying or calling it a blind spot. I think that's too easy. As we close, um, really open ended, just are there any are there any things we haven't been able to touch on yet? Any ideas, any thoughts, any parts of your book, any anything that um, that you'd want to leave our our listeners with? So one of the very practical questions that I'm feeling myself and also hearing from other people is what can we do? And when we feel so overwhelmed by so many challenges um, from the rise of hate and hate crimes to war and conflict around the world, Yemen, Syria, <clears throat> Burma, climate change, there's just so much happening. It's easy to feel a sense of despair. And so I'm thinking a lot about how to keep hope alive and what does it mean to have hope? And Professor Wiesel spoke about hope all the time. And he said, quoting Camus, he said, where there is no hope, we have to create it. And it took me a while to realize that the hope he was talking about was not quietism. It's not sitting on your couch watching Netflix, hoping something will change. It's an active hope that gets you off the couch to go do something. And so I think that there are two challenges to this hope. The first is complacency and the refusal to look at what's happening. And I'm noticing in myself the impulse to look away when certain things come up on my Facebook feed and the obligation I feel as a student of Elie Wiesel to look and to look even when it's really uncomfortable. But then when you look, it's very easy to feel despair or to feel overwhelmed by so much pain and suffering in the world. And that's the second move, I think, is to refuse to despair. And what's left is a sense of active hope that I have to go do something. And so Elie Wiesel said to his students often, what it means to go do something is not necessarily to travel around the world and put on a flak jacket and bear witness in the way that I did. But he said, look for the outstretched hand. Look in your own circle for someone who needs you, for someone who needs help. And if you're consistently someone who notices people when you're walking on the street and treats them as human beings, that really does make a difference in the world. And if you consistently bring smiles to the faces of your children or other people's children, that makes a difference. To me, this is the most practical, specific teaching that I carry with me from Professor Wiesel that's helping me in a moment of crisis. I think we're in a moment of crisis and that I try to share with people now. Look for the outstretched hand. Thank you so much, Ariel Berger, for joining us. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. And thanks so much to all of you out there listening. We really appreciate you tuning in, and we hope that you'll do so in the future. Uh, we want to close out this episode, as we always do, by encouraging you to be in touch with us, and there are a wide variety of ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. Second, you can go to our Twitter feed at, at Judaism Unbound. Third, you can go to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And last but not least, you can hit us up via email at dan at judaismunbound.com or lex at judaismunbound.com. The last request we'd like to make is that we really deeply appreciate any amount of financial donation you're able to set aside for us. And you can do that either on a monthly recurring basis or a one-time gift at judaismunbound.com slash donate. So thanks so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.